Thank you. In my perverse entirety, God, I never saw any of those trailers before. Um, hello. Uh, what I'd like to do today, if it's okay with you, is to take any questions you have and to maybe find out what you're about at the same time. So um, I don't know if you want to start asking questions, that's fine. And then I think there are microphones on the side in case anybody has anything to um, ask me, you can go over there and attack. Um, and then I'd kind of like to uh, have an exchange here because that's basically why I'm here is out of curiosity and find out what you're about and give you a chance to know me a little bit better. So, um, does anybody have any questions? Anyone want to start <laughs> since we don't have that much time? Yeah. Yeah, well, I thought about this question all day, and I really couldn't come up with much except that um, on, I believe earlier this week you said you wanted to find out about uh, the opinions of UCLA students. Mm -hmm. And since I've always thought you were incredibly intriguing and attractive, I was wondering if you'd like to have coffee and find out about my <laughs> opinions after this. Gosh, you know, so much of brilliance has to do with the right timing, and I'm leaving this afternoon, oh, but too bad. maybe we can talk later. I'd, I'd like to. <laughs> okay. So, at least we've accomplished one thing today. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, a year ago, you told the New York Times that um, <laughs> acting teaches one to become um, less judgmental. Uh, to what extent has this lesson uh, learned from your acting career influenced uh, Susan Sarandon's citizen in your political beliefs and activities? Let's get We're more Probably the aspect of acting that I most treasure is the fact that it roughs you up a bit and uh, doesn't allow you to get too um, uh, secure in the past and in preconceived notions that you might have. It's constantly, if you're any good at all, I think forcing you to always examine everything and to really try to listen and to keep your passion um, on the tips of your fingers, or at least on both sleeves with your heart, so that you can commit to things when they're, they speak to you in that way. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Yep. Um, I realize that, that you are obviously not involved in Rocky Horror anymore, but that's how I... I get <laughs> quite a few letters from parents who are furious that they're still <laughs> driving their kids. But that's how I know you best, and, um, and I think that's how a lot of people have gotten to know you. And I was just curious to ask what it was like to work with Tim Curry and Richard O'Brien. They both seem to be such creative people. Well, I had met Tim before I did the movie, which is how I got in that. <laughs> because I was actually out here to do a, a real grown-up studio film. Right, right. And, um, <laughs> London for no money to do the Rocky Horror Show because of my friendship with Tim and because he convinced me that um, the variables on the Rocky Horror Show were more interesting than the givens on the film I was supposed to do. And um, I had pneumonia for quite
look back on that time and I see the pictures, I think we must have had a wonderful time. But in fact, it was fairly miserable. But Tim is still a very good friend of mine. I saw him just recently. Um, he'll be coming to Los Angeles to do a film uh, pretty soon. And I, I'm very proud of that film. I think that um, the whole idea of uh, not dreaming In England, or yeah. was it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It was shot in a house that's used for the, a lot of the Hammer horror films, which was about and had hardly a roof, so it was freezing. Yep. Hi. I wanted Hi. to thank you for um, Who Am I This Time? That was my, one of my favorite Thanks. Shows. I like that, too. That's one of my favorite. And I just wondered if you had any experiences to re relate on that show. Well, to do without screwing it up too much. And walking uh, or professionals. I love the story. I love the, um, the spirit of that story. And, I, and of all the things I've done, I most like the effect that it seems to have on people. I'm very pleased with that. And also Kurt Vonnegut felt that it was a very good um, interpretation of his story, which also makes me very pleased. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi. I read your article in Cosmopolitan this last month, and I wanted to say it was very interesting, and you had a lot of great things to say in it. And I wanted to direct this question on your movie The Tempest and your mm -hmm. role in that, and how did you like working with John Cassavetes, and how do you feel that that role that you play in that film you know, relates to the character and the person that you are? Ooh. Um... I loved working with John Cassavetes and Jenna Rollins and most of the people on that film. I mean, that was the plus side of doing The Tempest, besides the fact that I'd never been to Greece before. But um, in terms of the character, um, <laughs> Paul and I had a lot of um, rather heated uh, discussions about the character because I felt that, you know, she's supposed to be Ariel, and I felt that his concept of what a free woman was was a little off um, because she was still very centered around men but when that couldn't change when we didn't quite we, I started it with the idea of having rewrites I cut my hair off to try to make her a little bit less the fluff person that they wanted but finally it's a director's vision and um, he also didn't think that John and I should care about each other in the film and we felt very strongly so we just said his words and did what we wanted to do and that's probably why it's so confusing <laughs> but um, I don't think she's very much like I am except that she keeps trying which I think is really important but I asked him to cut which he did he did a number of things I mean he was very um, uh, open to certain aspects because making a film is some kind of an exchange and for instance the song that we sang Why Do Fools Fall In Love was something that I had worked up with Molly because she was bored to tears there. It was not in the movie and he put it in after we did it for him and at the end he had wanted me to repeat my whole spiel that I originally do to John to to the new guy and um, I felt that she really hadn't learned anything if she just went right on with the same old number and he let me cut that too. So it was a give and take but I didn't, um, I didn't feel that comfortable with that character. I felt more comfortable with the location. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I saw two movies with you. One is Atlantic City and The Hunger. I wonder if you have anything interesting to tell about the people you worked with for these movies or any incidents that happened that you want to relate. Not the really interesting ones. I don't think I could. Um, <laughs> I'm a great believer in a certain amount of privacy. I mean, it was great working on... Um, both those films, I mean the main reason for doing The Hunger for all three of us was to work with all three of us and with the new, the new director whom we really liked. And um, making the film was very interesting and a lot of fun and I got to know everybody very well. <laughs> and Atlantic City, um, we shot very quickly and uh, you know, Bert was great. And, um, no, I guess I don't have anything interesting I can really talk about. <laughs> 
I'd yeah. like to know if you could talk a little bit about um, the, your role in Extremities and what first drew you to the role and did you ever think would have such enormous appeal that it did? I don't know if appeal is the right word. It definitely caused a lot of trouble and I was hoping that it would um, be theatrical. That was fairly clear that inherent in the play that it was very theatrical and I was drawn to it because of the issue and because it was a fairly impossible role. Um, I didn't, in my naivete, didn't understand how physically impossible it was. I knew it would be difficult emotionally. And also the character was a plot character. She didn't have much personality and she certainly didn't have a great sense of humor, which I'm not used to playing. Um, it was about power and victim mentality, which I feel very strongly about and wanted to understand a little bit better because rape is not a crime of sex, it's a crime of power. And I think that in doing the play and drawing attention to the issue that um, we accomplished a lot. Um, so I was pleased that I did it. I just couldn't take it past a certain point because I was physically damaged and psychologically not in great shape after about five months, so I, that's why I had to leave it. But I, I'm pleased that it got the attention that it did. Yeah? Um, you're known as, as, for instance, in the trailer, the one who is sensual. Uh, your sex is a product. I think that's sold. You know, that's an item. That's not what I want to argue. But I want to know how you take these roles and for instance starting with Rocky Horror where you were you know bearing your breasts and you still do how do you justify that within yourself um, well I don't bear my breasts in Rocky Horror I have a I'm well. covered in Rocky Horror um, I think that my breasts are slightly overrated um, <laughs> they've only actually been bared in two films they happen to have been very controversial films but in Atlantic City you don't see my breasts um, and the other work, I, I think that probably as breasts go, mine have been probably less exposed than most. But I've gotten mileage out of the times that they have. Um, you know, I do a lot of different parts. I choose parts from what I'm offered. I turn down a lot. I turn down a lot of violent films and sexual films. I turn down a lot of films where the woman's clothed, but she's really stupid. I turn down... Um, have always turned down a lot of scripts. Um, finally, I choose roles that either I want to learn about, that I feel are really hard, I want to work with certain people, I, feel, I believe in the film, I believe in the situation, I need the money. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons to, to take a film. Um, I've never turned down um, Norma Ray or Silkwood or Private Benjamin or Gandhi. Um, I would have loved to have done a film like that. I mean, it's like anything else, you know, you, you do the best with what you've given. Um, and I think it's great if there can be someone who's considered, I mean, I've been discovered about four times, one of which was definitely a sexual renaissance of some kind. Um, I think it would be great if we could redefine sexuality so that it would be all right to be sensual and smart. I think a lot of my appeal is that I'm also intelligent. Um, so I, it's a shame that Hollywood has a tendency to put all the sluts in one corner and all the ice queens in another. And it would be great if we could find some kind of in-between place where you could have a sense of humor and, and whatever. And uh, I don't feel any inconsistency with my own personal politics with the parts that I've done. Even with The Tempest where you had to give a little more uh, that didn't bother you, like, her, like you said about her character. I feel like she was led by men and also, you know, to be fulfilled sexually. Well, I mean, Pretty Baby, uh, the same thing. What, yeah. what, I, I don't believe in films. I'm a, I guess you'd have to reluctantly call me a feminist, but I don't believe in feminist theater. I find it very humorless. I believe that, for instance, that woman, to, to, to understand why that woman is that way. I mean, I, if I were just always playing people that were like me, I, I wouldn't be acting. So it, it, it's interesting for me to play a person and try to have people understand and find sympathy for somebody who is led around that way and hopefully by the end of the film that's why I changed the end 
because I hope by the end she had learned something. And in Pretty Baby, a woman who's a whore and, le and leaves her child, unfortunately in those times, that's the only, one of the few options that a woman had. And she does come back from her, for her child, and she does do what she does. But I d don't feel, uh, I mean, to, to, to make her human and to in any way have other women be compassionate for women who don't understand it. I mean, that girl in the Tempest, I hope, isn't uh, the majority of women, but, uh, you know, it would be nice to try to understand women who, who still think that way and try to give them a chance to get away from that, and maybe that film would do that. I don't think that I rewarded her for being that way. I don't think that she was overjoyed. She was obviously unhappy, which is the difference. Yeah. I was wondering, in a business that has so much uh, popularity and glamour... Has so much who? Popularity and glamour. Yeah. Do you feel like so much of the time, such as many of these questions, people ask you about who you have worked with rather than about you yourself, so that the whole situation kind of becomes a game? I mean, that it is not centered on you, but rather the people that you've met and the incidents, the anecdotes, the trivialities. And Trivial my second, pursuit, yes. <laughs> um, my second question is, do you prefer undergraduates or graduates? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the person. Um, right, you've just totally made me forget the first question. Um, oh, my trivial life, right. Um, no, I'm sorry, I did not mean your trivial life. It is simply the approach of so many people to what you do. Well, you know, I mean, a lot of this comes along with the territory. I don't take it personally. Um, I feel very fortunate being able to be here today and find out what's going on with you. And I'll exchange some of the more trivial aspects of who I've been with or anything. I just won't give away anything that's too, too important because I have kind of an agreement with my friends. Um, but I don't know, I don't mind that so much, and a certain amount of privacy goes, but at the same time I have access to media or whatever that might make it easier for me to accomplish something that I'm... So it's a trade-off. Um, I don't think people that are really smart think that I'm, you know, judge me that much in those kind of superficial ways. And it's enough that people are moved by my work and are interested, and, and um, if they want to know those things, it's okay. You are judged very well. <laughs> I'm what? <laughs> you are judged very well. Oh, and I come out okay. Yes. Oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> yes. Were you happy with the way that the, the hunger came out as a whole movie? No. Do you have an explanation for that, considering the talent that was involved and the you know, the, some of the imagery was beautiful and the story I thought was a good idea. Mm. And the way the movie started out, I thought I was really in for something, but I don't, can, do you have an explanation for why the movie was so um, This was a first time director, he didn't have Final Cut. And I don't think the studio knew what they had and they made certain decisions and, and um, it was caught in the middle of a kind of takeover to studio too so it was kind of like trying to open up a business in a South American country with a revolution going on it was um, I don't feel it was really Tony Scott's fault but you know so many different things can happen to a movie f between the time that the script is finished and it's cut and marketed and it actually comes out and uh, uh, it's, I, I think it's a miracle. It's, it's like magic when something comes out and it's anywhere near what you expected. Uh, it's very, very rare. So um, I try to, to just participate fully in the process and get whatever I can in the moment and, and in a sense kind of let go of it because 99% uh, of the time you're either highly disappointed or you don't know whose vision it was. Um, so I try not to get too emotionally involved on finally what happens. I mean, it does break your heart, but you have to just keep going on. Okay. Uh, I think I read somewhere that you attended a Catholic college. Is that is that true? Yep, Catholic University in Washington D.C. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> 
Does your Catholic upbringing, I assume you had a Catholic upbringing, uh, ever affect the way you choose roles, or does it ever, you know? Oh, I suppose everything about your upbringing, probably more so in terms of rebelling against it than embracing it, you know, influences you. I, I had trouble as early as third grade in terms of my Catholic upbringing. I was put in the hall for asking how... You know, the nun had explained to us that nobody was married if they didn't get married in the church, and I asked how Joseph and Mary could be married then since God didn't, since Jesus didn't invent it till later. So I started out very early in the hallway. And um, um, if you want to ever doubt your religion at Catholic colleges and deep introspection is the place that you will find it. Um, so I don't really think it influences me that much. One way, one way, deeply, no. Yeah? One of the things I admire most about you is your diversity of your roles. Uh, is there any new type of role that you'd like to tackle next? I'd like a movie that's just all about me, that the studio's <laughs> excited about, that it's a great project where there's a grown-up director, you know, and there's the right amount of money. <laughs> just something that is, uh, I, I feel a little bit as if I've, survive this long and I'm all dressed up with nowhere to go, you know. It's hard to find something that is so interesting and s everyone cares about it so much that comes up to the extent of your own involvement. So I don't have, um, I mean anything, there's a lot of different kinds of people I haven't played yet. Uh, yeah, I'm very open to possibilities. But it would be great to get a film that all the other elements are are positive. Yeah. Uh, yes, Susan, I, I have a question. It seems the more I get involved with life and the more commitments I take on, it seems like the, the hours in the day get to be less and less, and I can't get all the things I need to get done. Uh, could you give us an idea? Just the fact that you're here gives me indication that you have a pretty good grip on time management. Can you give me some sort of uh, idea on, on uh, your sequences that you have are the industry do they they give you uh, they give you teachings on on how to do this no and I don't haven't found a good wife yet either so I'm still having a lot of trouble trying to manage the personal and the professional I think you just have to figure out your priorities and then you find enough time you know you have to do what's really important to you and would find you write time. things down like the night before do you lay out the next day the next <laughs> I make lists of phone calls and things that I have to do, yeah, because um, everything tends to be such high pressure uh, in my life. But, um, and I do, sure, I, 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 the things that are really important I figure out for the next day, but I can't plan that far ahead. There's a, I'm a great believer in serendipity and, and grace and, and uh, the happy accident and all those things. So I don't plan months and months ahead. It's usually a relief to work for that reason because you just, it's like being in the service. You just show up, do what you have to do, and you can be very concentrated and you don't have to answer the phone and you don't read anything else and you, you know, you just work. Um, unless you get lucky and have something else going on where you have a nightlife too and then usually that works out all right. But otherwise it's a very limited it's in between films that it gets very hectic, especially with some of the things that I'm involved, the other outside activities that I'm involved with. Thank you. Hi. Yes? The uh, Daily Bruin earlier this week gave the impression that you uh, had mentioned that you wished you had an opportunity to play a role like Gandhi. I presume they meant uh, the role of Margaret Burke White in Gandhi. No, I meant Gandhi. <laughs> Did you mean a, a similar film or in the actual film, Gandhi? <laughs> and what I'd like is, is... It would be an extraordinary performance, wouldn't it, if I had played Gandhi? Quite remarkable. a challenge. Um, could you comment on, on that film and how a film of that nature actually became popular with the current taste in movie going? I think it's a comment on that life, not necessarily the film. I think obviously people, I hope, it means that people are interested in alternatives of images of manhood and heroics and uh, alternatives to solving some of our problems. And uh, maybe a little interested in what India looks like and uh, sat through that film. 
with with that kind of inspiration. I hope. I mean, maybe it's the Times. I don't actually know how much business Gandhi did. It got a lot of press, but I don't know how commercial it was. So well, I couldn't. I think I after know. the Academy Awards, it was financially successful. Mm -hmm. um, one, one more short question. If someone had a, a project or a role that they thought would be appropriate for you, how would they get in touch with you? Through William Morris, my agent. And I read everything. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Are we out of questionnaires? Questioners. Um, oh. I'm, yeah. Oh, yes. A lot of people think that the finest performance an actor and actress could give is one where the actual performance seems so effortless that you really can't tell the actor is working hard at the craft. Now when you take on a role, I'm curious, do you find it more challenging to put your personal imprint on a role and define the character as your own or say try to reach that ultimate goal of giving a say effortless performance? I don't think that much about it and I don't talk that much about acting and I don't trust actors who do. <laughs> I think you just get it and you try to make it truthful and, and uh, you certainly are more obviously off when you do an aggressive character than when you base it totally on yourself and do things that are small. It's a safer way of it working and depending on the character, it, it, you know, whatever it takes into, it, you use whatever you need. But The King of the Gypsies, for instance, was so far from who I am and, and um, but there are people who, who work better when they're hiding behind more stuff. I think it's easier for a lot of men to do real characters than it is to work expose themselves because a lot of the traits that go into acting are considered feminine. Is it easier for you to draw from past experiences or, say, put on a mask and try something different? It's never easy. I don't know. I don't know. It's it's it depends on the people and the the part. I don't I don't know. How would you like to use your access to the media? What would you like to accomplish? Is there a message that you want to you know? Okay, say? I'm so glad you asked <laughs> since it's almost time to go. <laughs> um, for instance, today. Um, this is a certain kind of media, but I'm, first of all, it would be nice to find out what's going on here. And secondly of all, I don't have an answer and I don't have a message, but I would like to encourage, especially where disarmament's concerned or Central America or any of these issues that are going to affect so strongly our future or our survival, encourage you to ask questions, encourage you to write to people, and encourage you to find out as much as you can about these issues and uh, make your own decisions and come up with whatever creative uh, alternatives you possibly can because I feel that the future is really with you guys. So that's one of the reasons I'm here and one of the reasons I'm able to be here is because of media. And I also have a number of flyers here that have a listing of organizations that can give you information on these issues bipartisan kind of information, whether you're a nurse or an architect or an engineer or whatever, with me so I can leave them here and anybody that's interested I can give this information out. So that's one of the things. And just to ask people to ask questions, to be aware of uh, what our country's doing in our name with our tax dollars and to um, take responsibility and to feel hopeful to kind of in some way be a link so that people can understand that there are people that feel they can make a difference and to take it out of the hands of the experts and back into people's hands. I don't know if anybody here even cares about really what's going on. When I spoke at um, Harvard about six months ago, people weren't the students there weren't particularly interested for instance in what was going on in El Salvador and felt that the first priority was uh, securing a job. I found that in the East there were a lot of people leaving the fine arts programs to go into medicine and um, law and um, mar most of the students couldn't quite understand how I could be a kind of freelance liver and not be attached to a, uh, an institution. So I'm kind of curious as to what your thoughts are about 
that and what your dreams are and where your passions lie. And uh, since I'm a movie star, I get to come here and ask you. <laughs> so that's one of the ways. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So what is it, guys? Uh, what do you like to do for fun when you're not working? <laughs> what do you think about what's going on in El Salvador? Uh, he asked you that question over there. Well, this is what I like to do for fun. I have another question. I don't know what he was thinking. Um, Catherine Deneuve has built up a certain mystique over the years. I was wondering if it was uh, comfortable working with her, especially. Her mystique is totally justifiable, and she's a great woman, and I'd like to grow up to be just like her. I think she's fantastic. She's raised children on her own. She's funny. She's bright, and, and she's really wonderful. She was very easy to work with. I had to do... I think she's probably the first love scene, the real, first real love scene I've ever had, because I've never actually had a love scene in a film before. How much did Tony Scott direct you guys in that, and how much was it just left up to your own? <laughs> we talked about it before. The scene, um, one of those scenes I actually wrote, the one between the piano and the bed, was mine. So we talked about it quite a bit. Thanks. Is anybody over there? No. Yes. Um, if it's not too much of an imposition, could I get a kiss? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, why don't you wait till after so we don't okay. hold things up? <laughs> Hi. Yes. Um, I'm over here. Yes. Can I uh, tell you briefly what, what my thoughts are about El Salvador? Mm. Um, The country is um, in obviously a, a, a very stressful situation and the people with the least money in El Salvador and feeling the most political pressure from the current government are under a lot of pressure, I think, to take up arms and, and rebel. Um, as, an alternative, as an American and with the current government in this country, my, my opinion is that, at that to do that would, res, would would result in uh, even greater violence and death than has already, uh, than currently exists, the state that currently exists in El Salvador. Um, I think that... Uh, to do what? To take up arms and, and, and promote armed revolution similar to what happened in Nicaragua. Uh, I think in Nicaragua, the political climate in the United States was such that, that they were, the rebels there had uh, an opportunity to do that successfully. I'm not sure that that would happen today, and I'm afraid that the United States would intervene. Um, if I, you don't think that we've intervened now? No, I think they would intervene with, with full, a full army. Um, and uh, my, certainly the United States has intervened at this moment. I think the people of El Salvador have opened as a better avenue to politicize people in the United States, to educate people in the United States, and help United States citizens turn our government away from the support that they've been giving the current regime. I think that there's a lot of um, education that needs to be done on Central America. Um, there have been about 60,000 people killed in El Salvador. I don't know that much about El Salvador. I'm, I know more about Nicaragua. I don't pretend to be an expert on either case, in either situation. All I ask is that you know that when we talk about destabilizing a government, and in Nicaragua the revolution was done fair and square, and their illiteracy rate, their health care programs, everything has been so drastically changed. They just want to self-determine. All I ask is that we examine this habit we have of bopping into countries constantly, um, usually supporting horrible fascist dictatorships, unfortunately, with our tax money in wars that haven't been declared. Um, this is un-American, according to our Constitution. I think that we should be able to decide how, what, what happens. I mean, these governments have both proposed plans for coalition governments that we haven't even read. Um, 
So I don't want to open this up into a debate about El Salvador. I guess what I'm asking more is, do you care? Is anybody here, you know, watching? Is anybody here asking questions? Um, it, it, does anybody want to know what's going on? Um, in, in terms of, you see, because I really believe you guys are the answers. Um, it frightened me when I went to Harvard and found that there was a certain lack of passion about people's future. Uh, people talking about taking jobs they didn't really care that much about, you know, and, and I wouldn't want to be in your shoes now. I mean, it's a really tough <laughs> place. And when I was in your place, and like everybody does, makes, made a vow to change things, you know, I didn't realize that if we didn't keep our vow, th the whole world was going to end. I mean, I don't think there's ever been a gen generation, I, I grew up in the late 60s, where, I mean, it was really on the line whether or not anything changed. We thought that that was just part of being young, you know. We didn't understand that we were getting, like, major wars and decisions. And it seems to be happening again. This involvement in, this, in these countries, these little wars, you know, are what lead to the big ones. And this whole disarmament issue and the fact that so many kids are talking about like depression, post-depression yes, parents about getting a house and getting a job and securing their future, it scares me a little bit because I don't know if that's, if you really can secure your future. And I don't know if maybe the answer isn't in following your heart and doing whatever you really believe in and you will be commercially successful if you find something that you really care about. Now, I know you guys are doing more than surfing out here. <laughs> And I'm kind of curious to find out what's going on and if this climate had just changed. So when I ask about El Salvador, they're very complicated issues, and, but not so complicated that you can't ask your representatives to at least explain to you why they are murdering thousands of women and children and starving them and boycotting them and training people who are keeping these wars going with our uh, planes and our guns and our... I mean, we're at war in a lot of different places, and you guys are the ones that are going to bear the brunt of it. Um, I mean, are you at all frightened about what's happening, or are you optimistic, or do you just try to ignore it, or what? Do we have anybody at a... You don't have to go to a mic. Yeah? I don't speak this language. Well, at least you feel passionately about it, and I totally agree. Oh, propaganda I got. This is true. There is propaganda on many sides. Does anybody else have anything to say? You talk about the future lies with us, yeah. but a lot of us are students and we feel helpless because we don't have the power that you command. And I feel, you know, personally I feel like my major thing is to get into a position like you have and then maybe I'll be able to, to institute a change. But I agree. Um, I think that that's, that's a good plan if we're around that long. You know, I think the only thing is we're working under a certain timetable, and I think there are a lot of things you can do, and there are a lot of creative things. I don't. What line of business are you interested in going into? I'm in uh, theater. Theater. Well, I'm, the media. I mean, is it's a very important thing. There are documentaries that are being done, all kinds of, not only educational things. I, for instance, I think that if you take it down to a very basic issue. The images that men have of what it means to be manly and heroic, and if you listen to what the government puts out in terms of all the explanations of why we do what we do, it's so about strong and not, you know, about hard and not soft and about policies and, and not seeming like a sissy. It's all so macho, and the industry has been responsible for most of the images of what it means to be Just masculine. And the whole idea of war as rites of passage that we've been given in films and everything else, it's just a different war now. So maybe in the media, you know, or in theater, whatever, you can 
get to the point where you can start to affect people and just ma challenge their perspective. But in the meantime, I think a lot can be done. I don't know who in this room is registered to vote. I think you can't, you know, you talk about the fear of communism and nobody votes. What's the difference? You tell people they can't say what they want to say. I mean, it sounds totally what we think of in our limited little minds as being communist. I mean, people have to vote. You have to talk about things. You have to go back to your friends and say, did you see what's on the 6 o'clock news, you know? At some point, you have to decide to stand up and be counted. And whatever you find, whatever you find might interest you, or whatever um, specific Right. <laughs> Three o'clock. Right. Um, whatever you decide, I mean, this man's obviously very frustrated. At least he cares enough about something, whatever it is, to be frustrated. Um, I think that you can find uh, different organizations or whatever that can, yeah. Susan? He's saying that it's very difficult to find the truth, and this is frustrating. You can't get the truth from the left or the right, and, and what you have to do is, is start worrying about your survival. And in this sense, you can get enough information to know what really sounds insane. You know, I mean, like, there's certain things that you just know don't make sense. And I think, no, we don't get a lot of news here. I mean, when I was in Europe and the whole covering of... Uh, all the invasions of Granada and all of that were very different than what they were in this country. But I don't think you have any choice. I think you still have to be involved. You know, if you don't pay attention, it's not going to make it any better either. And maybe with enough demand, you'll start to weed out at least a facsimile. Susan, we only have time for one more question. All right. Thanks for coming. Miss mm -hmm. Sarandon. I don't think there's that much of distortions. You, it's, not an, it's just not a good enough excuse. You're right, it's difficult. But it's your world and it's your life and it's worth taking the time to try to weed it out. And there are some people here that you can talk to if you, that are very verifiable. The Union for Concerned Sciences, Phys Physicians for Social Responsibility. There are a lot of people, you can listen to what they say. The actual specifics of how, what you do about that then is a personal decision. Ms. Sarandon? Yes. As having just seen Under Fire recently, I was impressed that a Hollywood film, a major film, about the Nicaraguan Revolution managed to essentially reduce that event, that historic event, to a, a series of gun battles and a love story. And I wonder, do you have any advice for how a would-be screenwriter is able to obtain financing to produce a film about great historical events going on now with that has both traumatic value and the serious political uh, point of view. And is it more difficult to do that in Hollywood than in Europe? Is it even possible to do it in Hollywood? Well, probably not within a big studio system, but there are some people. I think the important thing is to get a really good script that's about specific people and not just about uh, polemic or some idea. I mean, it has to be specific or people don't get really interested. If you have a great script, there are people that are, uh, especially at independent film places that can make movies like this. Costa Gravis is doing a movie and the actors work for nothing. You know, it's possible. What you have to have is some kind of a commitment and a really good script and then interest a director. You know, you can get funding. You, I think the problem is not in, in, in making it real. The problem is in making it good to begin with. Wow, it's gotten quiet on the home front. <laughs> so I guess everybody's leaving. <laughs> no, huh? Um, is everyone supposed to leave? Is that why I've been told to stop? Yeah, it's time for classes. But thanks a lot, Susan, for coming. So I'm going to leave some of these down here. If anybody wants to take one and see what they are or take some to your dorms or to whatever.